um, speech this morning. That's quite a. Um, would you regard it as a bit of a slap to to the Americans and the Japanese to hurry up and stop talking and, and get on with some action around free trade? Well, it's a serious message. I mean, what we're saying is the world is spending well over two hundred billion dollars a year in subsidies. Fundamentally, they are not affordable. There's a way through reducing those subsidies to make sure that it's fair for everyone, uh, and that is through the WTO process. And secondly, um, if we just embark on FTAs, we can deal with the issue of access, so getting our goods and services into other markets, but we can't deal with those other imbalances. If you take Europe, they're spending well over a billion dollars a week on subsidies. We know these countries are highly indebted, and I think it's a logical way through. So from New Zealand's point of view, real gains to be made if we can get uh, Doha resurrected. Do you think they're hypocrites in, in some ways? When they come to these conferences, sign up, talk about it, but return home and the protection stay in place? There's always historical challenges and I think we've got to say, uh, look, you know, this, the good thing about something like APEC is that in the course of the 20 odd years this has now been going, uh, we have made progress and we're seeing that with things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership which could ultimately lead to a free trade agreement between amongst others, New Zealand and the United States. Uh, but yes, we need more liberalisation around the world. And I think we've just got to front up to those really serious challenges that we have. Most Are they countries... listening though? Do you think they're listening? Uh, yeah, look, I think you will see progress there. But you know, we need to uh, acknowledge that these are countries around the world now that have significant uh, levels of government debt. They have significant deficits. They've got no obvious pathway back to surplus, and yet they need to get there. And here is a way of them cutting costs, which has got to be a lot more politically palatable, I would have thought, than cutting health or education funding. Doha has been stalled since about 2008, though. So what kind of what chances are, are there of, of it getting going again? Well, the G20 itself has been asking ministers to go back. Um, it's really been on ice, I think, for the last couple of years, as I said in my remarks. There's some real progress that's been made. There's an actual deal that's sitting on the table. What's sitting outside that is really the issue of agricultural subsidies. And that is the stumbling block, and that's the area where progress needs to be made. But in my view, uh, we can only go so far with bilateral and regional deals. We ultimately need uh, that global environment. And as I said in my remarks, um, even if we continue down this pathway of regional uh, free trade agreements, they won't deal with the issues for developing countries. We heard from the Russians though today that they are still quite nervous about the idea of opening up, in particular around farming. So it's not going to be easy, is it? Yeah, I think there are challenges. I mean, if you think about what the Russians are saying, and I mean, I took away from the minister's comments, and he's very senior. I mean, he's coming to the meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin tomorrow, so he's coming with the foreign minister and the president. Uh, that yes, they want to make progress. Yes, they want to move forward. And this customs union that they've developed, essentially between uh, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, has been a very important step for them. Uh, there are always domestic challenges and issues to confront. But on the other side of the coin, we know that Russia is looking at potentially up to 30 FTA and the one with New Zealand is one that's a real possibility, it's probably arguably closest and while it has challenges, it, it, as he said himself, forms the blueprint of the opportunity for Russia to is expand. It, is it harder though than the officials thought two years ago when you kicked it off in Japan? These things are always hard. Um, we've got a number of FTAs where we're tantalisingly close. I mean, arguably it's the same position in Korea and a little bit further back with India. Uh, Taiwan, we're looking in, in much better shape. Uh, so I think it, it does, in one sense, hang in the balance. It's a political decision, ultimately. Um, and in the end, the CFTA will go ahead. If Vladimir Putin wants it to go ahead, and it won't if he doesn't. So you're waiting for a signal from him at this conference? Well, I think waiting for uh, signals from him when we go and talk to him, which tomorrow you know, we'll deal with that issue of, of the bilateral, but in the end, um, our clear message is New Zealand is ready to engage uh, with these countries uh, led by, by Russia and the CFTA. We think there are advantages to both countries and we'd like to make progress. But you say hangs in the balance, which is an interesting terminology, because oh, I thought it was more advanced than that. It is, but in the end to get an FTA over the line, in my experience, uh, requires not only the officials to, work, to do all the work, but it needs political leadership. And that's because there are always the domestic concerns which you know, raise themselves. That was no different if you wind the clock back to when New Zealand and Australia signed CER. Back then there were still politicians saying this would not be a good thing. Now 30 years plus on, would any of us unwind that agreement? Not what, what are the stakes?